All right, we're going to be in Genesis 36 this morning, 36 and 37. Yeah, we're going to be going uh, over here at the beginning, the descendants of Esau. And I want to start with a proverb and a, and a statement out of Matthew. But Proverbs 18.24 says, A man who has friends must himself be friendly. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs will keep you out of a lot of trouble if you read them. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, wisdom for us to glean. And we have here, of course, between Jacob and Esau, two brothers. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. In Matthew 12, Jesus is uh, sharing and some people come and say, Hey, your, uh, your mother and your brothers are looking for you. And in verse 48, Jesus answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And one question for me as we begin to look at the genealogy here in Esau, and we unpack a little bit more of the uh, story here that's recorded for us is, is a question of who is my brother? Who is my brother? This, of course, goes back to the, uh, we even look at this for the first and second commandments, right? The first is loving God. The second is loving our neighbor. Who is our neighbor? The people God places around us. But who is my brother? So I want you to have that as a backdrop uh, as we begin Genesis 36. Verse 1, now this is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan. Adah, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. Ahilibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zebian, the Hivite. And Basemeth, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebahath. Now Adah bore Eliphaz to Esau, and Basemeth bore Raul. And Ahilibama bore Jeush, and Jalem, and Korah. These were the sons of Esau. Who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, and his daughters, and all the persons of his household, his cattle, and all his animals, and all his goods, which he had gained in the land of Canaan, and went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together, and the land where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. Esau is. Edom. Okay, so verses 1 through 5 list for us the sons born to Esau and Canaan. This is kind of a break for us in one way as we get through Genesis. Uh, as we have this story of Jacob developing in chapter 37, we get into the story of Joseph. And we have this chapter here that's a break that gives us all the lineage of Esau. Uh, verses, 19 through, uh, verses 9 through 14 Go on to list the sons that were born to him at Mount Seir. Verses 15 through 19 list the chiefs of the sons of Edom. Verses 20 through 30, the sons of Seir. Verses 31 through 39, the kings of Edom. And verses 40 through 43, another list of chiefs. And so a quick review for Esau is he is the twin brother, of course, of Jacob. So Esau is Edom. Jacob is Israel, so they both have their names they had at birth, but they are also both symbolic given names of nations. And so just as Jacob is Esau, Esau uh, Jacob is Israel, Esau is Edom. Both were prophesied to have uh, nations as descendants. Genesis 25, 23, the Lord was speaking to Rebekah and said, Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So God told Rebekah before these boys were ever born that they would both become nations. One, of course, would be stronger than the other. The older would serve the younger. That is, Jacob or Israel being the younger would be the dominant one in the end. Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup. And Jacob later deceived Isaac and stole Esau's blessing. After that, as a recap, Jacob fled to his uncle Laban's house for about 20 years. He got married. 
uh, had, uh, has kids, and you know, he's returned to the promised land. But before he returned, at some point in that 20 years, Esau moved to Seir, which is south of the promised land where he's at. And, that, and that's where his people stay for a while. I should say that's where they stay for a while. They eventually kind of try to migrate back into uh, the territory of Judah like 1,000 or 1,500 years later. But verse 6, it says, Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the persons of his household, his cattle and all his animals, and all his goods which he had gained in the land of Canaan, and went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob. Esau moves away, I think, knowing the land belongs to his brother. He knew that the Abrahamic covenant was transferring to Jacob, not to him. And we also know he still becomes very blessed. Uh, physically, he has a lot of descendants, a lot of wealth. And so he's not the chosen son of Isaac. He's not the one that's chosen for the Abrahamic blessing or for the bloodlines of the Messiah. But in his lifetime, he's actually still very blessed. If you actually look at the beginning of both of their lives and even the first several hundred years, it would seem Esau was more blessed than Jacob. Uh, even though he had to leave the promised land, uh, Jacob's sons and his descendants, they, of course, will end up down in Egypt. And in Egypt, they will become slaves. As they are put into bondage, Edom is flourishing. They're, they're developing kings and kingdoms. And, uh, and so the immediate response would almost seem that if you were looking that Esau was getting more blessed than Jacob. Now, Jacob, of course, was also very wealthy, but if you recall, when he went and met with his brother Esau, Esau came with 400 men, and that was a lot more than what Jacob had. And so we see, again, even though Jacob was the favored one by God, Esau was doing just fine as far as physical or material wealth or things like that are concerned. Verse 7 even says, their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. And the land where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. And Esau, again it says, is Edom. The idea here of the land not being able to support them doesn't mean that there was literally not enough land in the geographical location. Uh, there was a lot of uh, small city, cities and towns that had laid claim to the land. And so there wasn't enough free land for them both to dwell there. Just as a, sometimes we can get that confused if we're just reading the text. And there wasn't enough land uh, that were, where they were able to dwell to support their livestock. And so they couldn't essentially dwell there as, as nomads without belonging to the city or state. But verse 8, Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. The Edomites... So here we are given Esau's genealogy, and uh, this, this idea of identifying Esau as Edom is consistent through this chapter and throughout the Word of God. Verse 19, these were the sons of Esau, who is Edom, and these were their chiefs. Verse 31, now these were the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the children of Israel. Again, showing they were established before the nation of Israel. And verse 30, 43, these were the chiefs of Edom, according to their dwelling places in the land of their possession. Esau was the father of the Edomites. Edom is mentioned over a hundred times in the Bible. So they remain a fairly significant uh, title, a fairly significant player, we could say, throughout the Old Testament. In the end, Edom does not acquire a good name. Now, we also we can recall is that Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And we talked about that in that uh, Jacob was chosen. And that idea of Esau I hated is Jacob I chose to be the lineage of Christ. Esau I did not. Right? And we see this so that in the midst of this, Esau in himself actually still had a fairly blessed life. Being as a descendant from Isaac. But in the end, his, uh, his lineage, his kingdom, so to speak, it com comes to an end. And one of the main things we can learn from Edom is the power of the Abrahamic covenant. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. We're going to run through some Old Testament examples of Edom, because as we're going through the genealogies recorded for us, I think it's important that we're familiar of this conflict and these opportunities 
that were there for Edom along the way. In Numbers chapter 20, we have the children of Israel. They've now been delivered out of Egypt, and they're trying to get to the promised land, and they ask for permission to come through the land of Edom. And so we're going to pick up in verse 14. It says, Now Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, You know all the hardship that has befallen us, how our fathers went down to Egypt, and we dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians afflicted us and our fathers. When we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent the angel and brought us up out of Egypt. Now here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your border. Please let us pass through your country. We will not pass through fields or vineyards, nor will we drink water from wells. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. Then Edom said to him, You shall not pass through my land, lest I come out against you with the sword. So the children of Israel said to him, We will go by the highway. And if I or my livestock drink any of your water, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. Then he said, You shall not pass through. So Edom came out against them with many men and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. We know that there was conflict between Jacob and Esau. In some ways, they patched up enough where they could get along, they could talk, but there was a lot of brotherly conflict. We still see this in a lot of ways. We can see it in brothers still today, this competition that can get going. Uh, and of course, they had some uh, betrayal and different things. They had some family dynamics going on of uh, uh, Jacob being the favorite of his mom and Esau being the favorite of his dad and all these things going on. And we see that as they get down the road... The, his descendants, they still have a, um, a, an animosity towards the children of Jacob. Moses, of course, had a very friendly way in which he sent to him, We are your brother Israel. Can we please just walk through the territory? And, and he's refused. And what happened here? Well, the king of Edom, he had a chance to bless Israel, and he missed it. He could have allowed them to pass through. In fact, he could have been hospitable and, and incurred a great blessing if he would have. If he would have simply uh, reached out to the people of Israel in this time and encouraged them in their way, he could have had an ally and a blessing. But instead, he refuses and threatens war if they try. He sets himself up against them. Later on, Edom and Israel would fight. They fight back and forth at different times. Uh, under King David, Israel defeated and essentially ruled over the Edomites for a time. Uh, but when it, Israel went into captivity, uh, when Judah went into captivity, the Edomites swelled up with pride when they went into Babylon. And the prophet Obadiah, his entire book, it's only one chapter, but the whole book is basically a rebuke to Edom. That's who he's dealing with. We're going to read uh, verses 10 through 18 out of there talking about... Uh, the way that they treated the Jewish people and God's rebuke to them for it at the time when God was judging Judah. So he's about five, eight, a little bit before, after, I mean, 600 BC. We have the children of Judah being brought into captivity by Babylon. And so that's kind of what some of the things we're reading about here in Obadiah and how did Edom respond during that time. And so we'll pick it up in verse 10. It says, for violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you. And you shall be cut off forever. And the day that you stood on the other side, and the day that strangers carried captive his forces, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. But you should not have gazed on the day of your brother and the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. 
For as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. But on Mount Zion there, will be deliver there shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them, and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. So Edom becomes a very powerful warning of the Abrahamic covenant, of the problem of when these people rose up and were cursing their brothers. They become a warning of more than just that. I think more than just the people of Israel, that that's definitely a part of it. There's also a warning about not rejoicing in your brother's calamity. There's this, uh, this warning and celebrating in another's trial, this warning of pride. Edom is rejoicing, essentially, is what we're reading here, is Israel and Judah's destruction, and they join in on the plundering and the capturing of the people. Uh, they should have acted like a brother, but they acted like an enemy. So as the people were fleeing, if the Edomites find them, they didn't give them refuge. They also met them with the sword or, or with the cuffs, so to speak, for slavery. Isaiah chapter 34, verses 5 and 6, it says, For my sword shall be bathed in heaven, and indeed it shall come down on Edom, and on the people of my curse for judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made overflowing with fatness, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra, and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Basra is the capital city uh, of Edom, uh, also tied with the city of, um, I believe, of Petra. Isaiah 34, verses 9 and 10, it says, Its stream shall be turned into pitch, and its dust into brimstone. Its land shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. No one shall pass through it forever and ever. It goes on to describe this place actually as a dwelling place of demons. Jeremiah chapter 49 Verses 17 and 18 says, Edom also shall be an astonishment. Everyone who goes by it will be astonished and will hiss at all its plagues. As the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, says the Lord, no one shall remain there, nor shall a son of man dwell in it. Ezekiel 35, starting in verse 1, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man. Set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it. And say to it, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against you. I will stretch out my hand against you and make you most desolate. I shall lay your cities waste and you shall be desolate. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Because you have an ancient hatred and have shed the blood of the children of Israel by the power of the sword. At the time of their calamity, when their iniquity came to an end, therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood, and blood shall pursue you, since you have not hated blood. Therefore, blood shall pursue you. Thus, I will make Mount Seir most desolate, and cut off from it the one who leaves and the one who returns. And I will fit its, mo its mountains with the slain, and on your hills, and in your valleys, and in all your ravines, those who are slain by the sword shall fall. I will make you perpetually desolate, and your city shall be uninhabited. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Because you have said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, referring to Judah and Israel, and we will possess them, although the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will do according to your anger and according to the envy which you showed in your hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I judge you. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have heard all your blasphemes, which you have spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are desolate. They are given to us to consume. Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me and multiplied your words against me. And I have heard them. Thus says the Lord God, The whole earth will rejoice when I make you desolate. As you rejoice because the inheritance of the house of Israel was desolate, so I will do to you. You shall be desolate, O Mount Seir, 
as well as all of Edom, all of it, they shall know that I am the Lord. You know, (laughs) very clear what is to happen with them prophetically, isn't it? There's one other passage I'm going to turn over. I don't have it up here in the PowerPoint. You can turn with me if you want out of Isaiah 63. Starting in verse 1. It says, Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Do you get the idea of the description, who it is? Of course, this is the the Lord Jesus. And it says, why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone and from the people no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments and I have stained all my robes. For the day of my vengeance is in my heart. And the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. And I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me. and my own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the people in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought them down, their strength, to the earth. (laughs) Well, Edom started out pretty good. It started out pretty blessed. It started out a lot stronger than Israel. But in the end, Edom is destroyed forever. It will not last. It will not be there in the millennial reign of Christ. They will cease to exist as a nation. But the nation of Israel will be upheld forever. You know, there's there's so many lessons we could pull out of these different things. And it's also so important that we don't judge things on the beginnings. How much more important are the ends? Sometimes we can look at the way things start. You know, if we were to look at Esau and we were to look at Jacob and we were to judge in the first hundred years in the eyes of man which nation was heading for greatness. I think we would have all guessed wrong. Because there was things that God was doing throughout this time in the background. Now, what happened with these people? Well, when, uh, when Judah went into captivity with the king of Babylon, Edom, uh, Edom raided Judean villages. They also sent prisoners to Babylon and invaded southern Judea. Shortly after that, they began to decline. Ara- Arabian tribes uh, began invading their ter- territory They became a province of Persia shortly after that. And then later, when Alexander the Great conquered the area, he changed the name from the land of Edom to Idumea. Uh, They continued to fight with the Jews back and forth. They had fights in the Maccabean period around 200 years before Christ. And the area, Idumea, was destroyed with the Jewish revolt uh, around 70 A.D. Essentially, from that time, the people of Edom have, have been... Um, not, not a part of, or the area, not really a part of history ever since the first century. Now, some people today see the Edom. Uh, Edom is still in the area of southern Jordan. Jordan is made up of the uh, ancient area of Moab, the Ammonites, and the Edomites. That's modern-day Jordan. And southern Jordan is where Edom was, or the land of Edom. So some people look at Edom, when you look at these prophecies here through Isaiah and Jeremiah, all these ones we just read, and there's more, these weren't even all of them, about their destruction. Uh, Some people look at these as warning that Edom has become a name for those who rebel against the elect of God, that they've become this uh, symbolism, if you will, and, and that that's what God's therefore referring to in the future. Other people still think it's quite literal, uh, that that. Edom, the land of Edom, will actually literally be destroyed. They see uh, Basra as the land of Petra, a place uh, that uh, will be a part of the end times where the Jews will flee during the tribulation and that Christ will literally come uh, down there and make war with the descendants of Edom and that the land will be desolate for a thousand years uh, during the reign of Christ. It will be a place of dwelling of demons like, uh, like the city of Babylon. 
And so those are kind of your two predominant views uh, when it comes to it. I don't necessarily think that you always have to pick one or the other. I think we can see that Edom both serves as a picture, and we know it won't be around in the millennial kingdom because he said he will destroy them forever. He is wiping them out. God is wiping them out. What a terrible thing to fight God as an enemy. God is the greatest ally in the world. He is merciful. He is just. He is a great king. He's a wonderful father. And you couldn't fight anybody more powerful or more terrifying. There isn't a courtroom in the world or in any spiritual realm that is half as frightening as the throne room of God. He is a very powerful being. When I was reading that about Isaiah 63, you know, and you're thinking of Jesus and his robe dipped in blood and stuff, and I'm thinking, this just doesn't look like the Jesus we see in movies today. You know, he sounds so much different. I mean, we portray Jesus as so soft. And, you know, he is incredibly gracious to his children. Uh, but when his vengeance is poured out on his, on his enemies, it is frightening. He is powerful. Uh, he is a powerful king, a powerful ruler. And he is gracious and kind to those who turn to him and ask for mercy. But those who are bent on being his enemies, they have an enemy indeed, and he will defeat them. And he will defeat them uh, completely. He is a great, strong leader. Some of the things we can learn from the Edomites. What are some of the parts we should learn? That's part of it as we're reading through these different things. What are the things we're supposed to glean? Well, of course, one of the questions I'd ask you about that is, who is my brother? That's a question that Jesus asked. Who's my brother? Edom, technically, right, is descendants as their blood brothers in a sense to Israel. But they didn't act like brothers. They weren't brothers in the way that they treated each other. They, they were more like enemies in the way they treated each other. And so we should work towards unity, especially within the body. The other thing we should learn is the Abrahamic covenant is serious. It's still in effect today. If nations rise up and they curse Israel, they will be cursed. If they bless Israel, they will be blessed. Here is Edom. They came in. They're seeing the destruction of Israel. They're seeing the destruction of Judah. And they're rejoicing. Yeah! Yeah! And so they move in to southern Judah. They start to take the territory, kicking people out of their homes, taking captives. Thought you were chosen, did you? <laughs> That's how they're treating them. They're going to sell you to Babylon, betraying them. But God was watching. Now, remember who brought Babylon. God was judging Israel. But he also warns us not to look on his judgment when he's judging people and start rejoicing. Start getting a haughty spirit. And these people, they're rejoicing. God's judging you. and He's giving us the promised land. That's what they were thinking. And so they move in. And they begin to curse the people of Israel. They begin to take from the people of Israel. And in the end, their own blood, their own deeds. God says, as you were doing, right? Them, basically, I'm going to bring back on you. And so there's a warning for us. Another warning for us is don't rejoice in your brother's calamity. You know, if you see a brother or a sister in Christ or even a friend and, and they're hurting, you know, we, we have this terrible sin nature. We have a terrible sin nature, you know. And sometimes you can watch some people or something, if they're doing really good financially, and then like, oh, they're starting to crash. You're like, see, knew it. <laughs> knew they were fake. We shouldn't rejoice on those things. Even if it was true, even if they were terrible stewards of the finances, we shouldn't rejoice when we see it. We should rejoice if our brother is blessed. We have such this lack of contentment with the way God made us. This is the problem with the devil. God makes him this beautiful angel. He's a powerful being. He's essentially a general in God's army. And what's the problem for him? It's not enough. It's not enough. What do you want? He said, I want to be like the Most High. It wasn't enough for him. And we can have this lack of contentment. We can sometimes look around at the way a brother is blessed, and instead of rejoicing over it, jealousy builds. And we're going to get into chapter 37, and that jealousy is dangerous. And if it comes into your heart, you need to cast it out. You need to get rid of it. So don't rejoice in your brother's hardships. Number three, we should always be willing to help a brother. 
how different this story would be if the king of Edom would have welcomed Moses and the children of Israel. He started to set a precedent that he could have started within his nation. He could have started a new direction. He was appointed a position of power. How different the outcome of Edom could have been if they reacted differently. So when you have the opportunity, whether it's a Jewish person or a brother in Christ, to help them, to bless them, take it. Bless your brothers. Bless your sisters in Christ. Don't let jealousy block where we actually work for their destruction. And then, of course, lastly with that is going back to the nation of Israel. Again, is we should also we should bless the Jews when we have an opportunity. Not, uh, not working again for their destruction. Let's get into chapter 37. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Most of the rest of the book of Genesis will be kind of focused around Joseph. Of course, not entirely his brothers will be involved uh, even uh, s- some of the different chapters will deal with him as a whole tribe, but the majority of the book left will be dealing with Jacob and the migration to Egypt. Abraham, God told Abraham uh, that this would happen in uh, Genesis fifteen thirteen. He told Abraham, "Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years." Uh, So here we have Joseph being introduced to us now. He's 17. He's a young man. And clearly his father's favorite and clearly the least favorite in the family apart from his father. The rest of the family is not near as fond of him. It would seem he has some good organizational abilities already showing in the way the positions that his father's placing him within the family. The tunic that his dad gave him, the coat of many colors didn't only signify a favoritism, but it probably signified uh, that he was given a position in the sense of of leadership and also the right to the firstborn uh, of the inheritance, in a sense, the one that would be the head of the household after him. And so you can also see why some of that's creating more and more jealousy within his brothers, uh, within these things, within these family relationships. Jacob's treatment and favoring of Joseph uh, we could say it was in part what leads to all his brother's jealousy. But it's also important that we remember the brothers are responsible for their own actions. Jacob had a favorite son, but it doesn't mean the rest of the sons were unloved. And a lot of that jealousy, a lot of that feeling that they deserved maybe some of the things Joseph was getting, that life was unfair was creeping in with the brothers. And it led to some sinful decisions. And we see that mistake within verse 4. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. You know, at first glance, I think we can think, you know, Jacob, you shouldn't have favored him so much. We can almost look at that and go, you know, why did he give so much favoritism? We should be sensitive. We should be paying attention to the things going on in our homes, how it's going to affect our kids. Sibling rivalry is still around. Brothers can still get at it in competition and stuff with each other, very much still today. Uh, But the other part, again, is, is focusing in on the brother's responsibility here. The brothers are furious about the way that they're being treated. And... You know, sometimes we can look at things and we make these assessments that Jacob was all wrong in this, but we also have other, you know, God God has a son that he prefers above the rest. We know that, right? We're all children of God, but we know that the only begotten son, he's, he's up here. The rest of us are here. We're all still really loved by God, though. Wouldn't you agree? 
we're all still really blessed. And so sometimes we can get into something like this and we can read into the story some things it doesn't say. It doesn't say Jacob didn't love his 11 sons, but he loved Joseph. It's just that Jacob was his favorite. And so he's still very much, I would imagine from what we know of Jacob, still very much loved the rest of his sons. They're still out taking care of his sheep and different things. Uh, they're, they're overall, they're still very blessed, but they're not as blessed as Jacob. And so they're, they're angry about it. They're jealous with it. And they allow this hate and this jealousy really to take root in their hearts in a deep way. And we see that as, it give, as it, the story develops. Let's go in verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose out and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. You know, a problem we can see sometimes with young men, and something we've probably all experienced, especially when we were young men, is, is bad timing. And doesn't mean the dreams weren't real, but, you know, running out when he woke up to tell all his brothers about it was probably the wrong idea. Probably wasn't the wisest thing to do. It's not that these dreams were not from God. It's the, uh, it's the idea of how was he being, how was he portraying them necessarily to his brothers? It's hard to imagine when you read this as you're reading about it and you're seeing that Joseph's a 17-year-old young man. It's hard to not see this as a little bit puffed up. Hey, check out this dream I had. And, uh, and most of us being, I think, truthful, if we had a brother like that, we'd probably smack him upside the head too. <laughs> um, we'd probably be like, yeah, well, welcome back to reality. You know, <laughs> here's the rake. Uh, that's probably more something how we'd react. But of course, what we're also seeing here past normal is the brothers weren't just upset with Joseph. They're filled with hate. They're filled with rage. You know, we can see this sometimes within brothers, right, where they can go at it with each other, but they're also still brothers. They still love each other. They're still committed to each other. And what we see here, this is a really bad situation. In the way that Jacob's brother or Joseph's brothers feel about him. You know, and brothers are a gift. Same brothers in Christ, brothers in life, they're a gift. I'm thankful for my brother. Right, he's a great brother. I got another great brother back in California. I'm even thankful for my brother in laws. I'm thankful for my brothers in the Lord. Brothers are a gift. But it's when they allowed this comparison and this competitive spirit to set in that divided them. When they're looking, oh, Joseph got that, and they're, oh, that's uh, so wrong. Why did Joseph get that? And then he comes, and he's got some comments that he probably should have kept to himself. Didn't help the situation. But they also are letting it get out of hand. Remember, Joseph's brothers are all older than him. They're probably in their 20s, early 30s. They should have some more maturity than him. So verse 12, Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said, Here I am. Then he said to him, Please go and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you seeking? So he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, They have departed from here, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near, then they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into the pit. 
into some pit, and we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Jacob's just sending his brothers, to, uh, just sending Joseph to check on the brother and the flock. And, uh, and again, we see that Joseph is in a position of favor with his dad. He's getting sent out. He's got his coat on. And when they see him, they immediately begin conspiring together how to kill their brother. And it's at this point we understand this is far beyond sibling rivalry. Joseph's brothers really hate him. Enough so that they're plotting to murder their own brother. This again reveals to us a deep sin in their heart. We can also stop. You know, this is an important thing sometimes when we reflect on sin. When the devil's leading us into sinful thoughts. What did they gain by his death? We can keep reading on the story. You know, even their actions, even though he doesn't really die, it doesn't work out good for them in, in the short run. Their relationship with their dad. Obviously, God's sovereign plan was still in play. In, in uh, keeping the family of Israel through the famine, that God could have kept them a multiple different ways. He didn't have to be this way. But what did they gain by his death? What reason could be given? And we see here as they're filled with this, with this hate, with this jealousy, killing their brother won't take care of it. It won't solve their problems. The problem is, is in themselves. So here they try to thwart the plan of God. They're obviously very upset with Joseph. They're obviously very jealous. As they say, we shall see what will become of his dreams. We can tell as these guys have been out shepherding, they had been talking a little bit about Joseph and his dreams. And now he's got the nickname, right, the dreamer. And, and so as his brothers see him, they began to plot his death. But verse 21, but Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. And then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Reuben's the oldest brother, and we see right here he's got that oldest brother responsibility trait where he's like, hold on, guys. <laughs> he's, he's, he's knowing, hey, when we get back, I got to tell dad what happened. <laughs> All right, so we, we can't do this. He doesn't tell him not to mess with him. He doesn't tell him to leave him alone. He just says, don't kill him. You guys can harass him, throw him in the pit. That's fine, but don't kill him. And he had a plan to come back and get him. And so that part we can see of Reuben go, at least he, he didn't want to actually kill Joseph. He had enough pity on Joseph where he's like, nah, we can scare him a little bit, but don't actually hurt him. Like, don't, don't kill him. Maybe not don't hurt him, but don't kill him. Uh, but we also see, perhaps out of this trying to play both sides, pleasing his brothers, but not letting things get out of hands with Joseph, you know, Reuben also is in the position to fully rebuke his brothers. No. We're not treating our brother that way, guys. And so he takes a, a, a stand, but he could have taken a stronger stand. And so good that he took a stand to some degree. Good that he at least stood and opposed them dying. But at the same time, how much better it would have been if he would have told his brothers no. If he would have stood up against them. Verse 25, and they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Galilee with their camels bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let, our, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver." And they took Joseph to eat. This again is a reference for us as mankind. The heart is exceedingly wicked. They do this to their own brother. So they throw their brother in a pit, and then they sit down and eat. 
showing us they got, their hearts are hard at this point. They're not feeling remorse. They're not sitting around talking like, should we have done that? Throw them in a pit. Sweet, let's get, let's get something to eat. So they're brothers by blood, but he's treated like an enemy. That's how they're treating him. They're not treating him in any way like a brother. Cold-hearted. Now Judah here has the idea to sell his own brother. Hey, let's not kill him. I got an idea. I'll be the nice brother. Let's sell him. Uh, of course, right? That's an insane idea that people would talk that way about their own blood. Let's sell him. What's even more amazing is Judah is the son of Israel. They'll carry the bloodlines of the Messiah. And to me, it also speaks of the redemptive power of God. Here's Judah. We can look right here and be like, Judah, that was so dumb. What a stupid idea. And at the same time, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that's a reminder for me. You know, often in times, people can get really held up by past sin. And they'll think, well, you know, because of this or because of that, I can't serve the Lord. I can't do something for the Lord because, because, you know, I have this in my back. Okay, well, Judah, part of the lineage of Christ, he had selling his brother as a slave to a foreign country. And before that, he had plotting to kill brother. So he had a pretty bad past. And this is just one event we know about. We don't know about all the rest of his, what we might call, normal sins. These are just parts that are recorded for us uh, here in, re- in regards to his interaction with Joseph. And so there's also this thing about redemption. It's amazing that God can change the world, that he can move through people that are broken like this. And you know what that is for us? That's a great encouragement because that means he can move through people like us. So thank you, Lord, for that redemption. So let's learn. Let's not be like Judah in this moment, but also know God can use you regardless of what things have been in your past. God can still use you for good. So they sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver, and he's betrayed now into slavery. Genesis 42, 21 tells us Joseph was pleading with his brothers when this happened. Uh, As his brothers were talking to one another, it says, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear him. Wow. Wow. I said, it's hard to imagine brothers being this cold. It's hard for me to imagine somebody in, the own, in their own family seeing another person in their family crying and begging for mercy as the brothers are just heartless. Just sell them. Get rid of them. Unbelievable. Verse 29, then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. And he returned to his brother and said, the lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they set the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, we have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized and said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now the Midianites had sold him into Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and the captain of the guard. I think at this point, as they get back and they begin to see Jacob mourning, that guilt and conviction start to set in for the brothers a little bit. I think now the, the seriousness of what they've done and the crime which they've committed is now plainly before them. As they look on the pain that they cause also their father. And you would hope at this point is when remorse started to happen in their hearts. But if not, we know as the story goes on, they will have remorse one day. And this, again, is an evil thing the sons of Israel did to their brothers and their father. One sin can often lead us down a trail. You know, it starts with this sin that they got this, this jealousy towards their brother. And this jealousy then turns to hate. And this hate then turns to this plan to conspire to kill him which then leads to selling them into slavery, 
which then leads to what do we tell our dads? Now we've got to come up with a lie. And now we've got to cover our actions. Because what we did, we know it's detestable. We can't admit it. So now they come up with this lie to cover it. And what was the fruit of all of it? Pain. Do you think the brothers were more happy off now? I don't think so. No, I think that sin came back and haunted them. Uh, was it better for in their home life? No. Their dad, wouldn't even re he refused to be comforted. Again, God can turn around and use these events. God can turn around and use these people. That's incredible. As we see the sovereignty of God. But we also have to be warned in ourselves that we have to be careful that we don't allow these sinful thoughts to develop into sinful actions. And these actions, again, they can put us on a path. If they wouldn't have allowed the jealousy, then they wouldn't have been filled with hate. If they wouldn't have allowed the hate, then they wouldn't have desired to murder him or sell him into slavery. If they wouldn't have betrayed their brother, they wouldn't have needed to lie to their father. And what kind of guilt do you think they lived with until the time they were restored with Joseph? What kind of baggage do you think they carried? So be careful. Be careful when the devil whispers those lies into your ears. Now Jacob here also mourns for his son as though he is really dead. In Jacob's view at this time, Joseph is gone. He's been torn by a wild beast. I don't think it even enters his mind that his own sons would conceive such a plan to deceive him. Who would think that of your own family, of your own kids, that they would do something like this against you? And so it doesn't seem that it even crosses his mind. And so Jacob, for years, lives in a false reality. He mourns for his son, but his son isn't actually dead. This is also, to me, another warning for us how often it is that when we believe a lie... How much it can affect our lives for years if we cling to it. And the devil is crafty when he throws them in. We see a lot of parallels between Joseph and Jesus. As we go through this study, we see a lot of different parallels. Some different commentators have counted over 100 parallels between Joseph and Jacob. Of course, we know that Jesus was treated similar by the nation of Israel. He was betrayed by his brothers. He was sold by one of the 12, by Judas. And so we see these different similarities that take place through the, through the events, and we'll highlight some of them. He's never used as an example, as a type of Christ in the New Testament, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily unfitting. It just means the New Testament does not mention it. But what are some things we should really learn also from this passage, from both these passages? We need to strive for unity as brothers, not just blood brothers, but as in the body of Christ. That is one of the prayers of Christ right before he goes to the cross. When he prays for his disciples and he prays for future believers, one of the things he prays for is unity with God for them and unity with each other. Keep them in you and keep them unified. Keep them from the evil one. And we need to strive for unity as brothers, not giving place to jealousy we need to be rejoicing when our brothers or sisters are blessed. Thank you, Lord. And we need to mourn with them when they're hurting. We need to come alongside them like family. Do not rejoice, again, at the suffering of others. As, as, as we saw Edom rejoicing at the suffering of the judgment of Israel. Instead, pray for them and minister to one another. Both Edom... And Israel were brothers, but they were filled with fighting between them, between the nations. Joseph and his brothers, they're, they're, they're the same house. They haven't even gotten to generations yet. And they have this fighting going on. And so it brings us back to the question we had at the beginning when Jesus asked, who is my brother? 
And in Matthew 12, verse 50, says, Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. We need to be in obedience to Christ and loving towards our brothers and sisters in the Lord. But mostly, of course, our love needs to be directed to the Lord. Our bonding together is our commitment to him. When should that bond ever be broken between two people? When should we not treat people? That, that line is simple. If there's a line in the sand and you can only love God or your brother, choose God. But when you can love them both, you love them both. And we don't love people away from God. We don't, lead, we don't go away from God chasing people. We keep the commandments in order, love God, and then love others. But so much then as it's within our ability, we need to guard against those issues within our own heart, within that rebellion of our own heart against our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time in your word. Lord, I thank you, Father, for how you guide us, how you teach us. Lord, I pray that you'd give us unity. Lord, we look at these examples. Lord, how wonderful it is to be your son, Lord. How wonderful it is, Lord, to rest in you. But Lord, how terrible is it for those who raise their hands against you. Lord, help us, Lord, to cling to you. But also, Lord, in our clinging to you, help us, Lord, to love our brothers. Not to be filled with jealousy, Lord, not to be filled with hate. Not to celebrate, Lord, at their downfalls. But, Lord, that we'd be filled with mercy and compassion and love. That we'd pray and intercede on each other's behalf. Lord, I pray, Father, Lord, that we wouldn't be yours in name only. But that we would be your brother or sister or mother doing the will of the Father in heaven. Lord, thank you so much for bringing us into your family. Thank you for your desire towards us. And Lord, help us to love you and to love each other well. In Jesus' name, amen. From creation to the cross There from the cross into eternity Your grace Yes, your grace.